I didn't even put my name on there. Uh, but I am Janice Anderson, and I work in the iBank uh, here at CORE. I have had the privilege, actually, of working in the iBank exclusively here at CORE for six years now. And actually love every moment of it. <laughs> so, um, how many of you know what part of your eye is the cornea? You know? Go ahead. All right, which part? What part's your eye? The windshield. Exactly, very good. The cornea is often referred to as the window of our eye. It's what allows the light to come into our eye so that the rest of our eye can work and our brain can see the images. When somebody has a cornea disease or, or a, a problem with their cornea, their window is cloudy and dirty and the image on the other side can be obscured entirely. It can be very distorted as in this one. A cornea transplant is like a window replacement. Okay, and it replaces that window with a clear piece of the cornea, and that person has much better vision. You heard a lot about history of core, and the history of eye banking goes pretty far back. And there's two people that are, I think are very important just to keep in mind. Can anybody think of when the first cornea transplant might have taken place? I'll give you a decade, just maybe name it a decade. The 50s, 60s? Okay. The first successful cornea transplant was performed in 1905. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There was an ophthalmologist in Eastern Europe by the name of Edward Zerm, and he was a well-respected, well-known ophthalmologist in, out there. He had two patients in his practice. One was a 12-year-old boy who had sustained a serious injury with a piece of steel that penetrated his eye, and he underwent several surgeries, and it became necessary to remove or enucleate that child's eye. He had a second patient who was a man who worked in lime mines, and he had severe burns to both of his corneas as a result of exposure to the lime. And when those burns healed, his corneas were very, very scarred, and he could not see, he could not work. So at Dr. Zerm thought, why not take the cornea from this 12-year-old child's eye that I have to remove that was not injured in this accident? and transplant it to my patient who has these terribly scarred corneas. And that's exactly what he did. And it was successful. And that marked the beginning of the realization that this was a viable treatment for people who have horrific scars or certain pathology to their corneas. And it could treat them successfully. It wasn't until the 1930s that corneas from deceased donors were actually being used and there was a surgeon in New York City by the name of R. Townley Patton. And he worked at Ioneer Infirmary, and what he did, he's credited for establishing the very first eye bank, actually in the world. <laughs> but what Dr. Townley did was he would go over to Sing Sing Prison uh, and talk to those prisoners that were on death row. And he would obtain permission from some of those prisoners so that at the time of their execution, their eyes would be donated and the corneas of their eyes be used for transplant. And he decided this was actually quite successful, but he decided there needed to be a more organized way than for him and his resident staff to continue doing this. So he and a woman by the name of Ada Breckenridge started what is now known as the Eye Bank for Sight Restoration in New York City. Uh, it is a very large eye bank, it is still very active, and from that eye bank, 10 eye banks grew across the country, and now there are more than 100 in the United States and many internationally. <clears throat> and that is where the creation of the Core Eye Bank really has its roots. In 1952, there was the Pittsburgh Eye Bank, and it was lovingly referred to as a refrigerator in the Department of Ophthalmology by the executive director at that time, because that's essentially what the Eye Bank was. Um, in 1980, the Pittsburgh Eye Bank became incorporated as a nonprofit agency and became known as the Medical Eye Bank of Western Pennsylvania. And in 1996, the Medical Eye Bank of Western Pennsylvania and CORE decided to join forces, okay, and come together and become one. And it, the CORE Eye Bank began October 1st of 1996. This cornea recovery, I'm going to show you exactly what happens during a cornea recovery. Um, and um, Pauline, yeah, I brought actually some corneas, but the corneas recovered 
on site, right at the donor site, okay? And the cornea is excised with a small band of sclera. You can touch these. Um, like Janice, Janice told us, they're sealed and they, there's no communicable diseases. You don't have to be afraid to touch what I'm getting. Yeah, they're all sealed. But they're real corneas. corneas. These are actually donor corneas that we're passing out. Read along. And these corneas were evaluated, and I'll tell you a little bit about that process in a moment. They were evaluated, and we determined that they were not healthy enough corneas to be used for transplantation. But the families gave permission for the use of the corneas for research or for education and training purposes. And, um, you know, so that's, but, so when the cornea is excised from the donor on site, it's placed into that container that you'll see there. Okay, and it's in a storage media, this pink media. It's called Optocell GS. And it will keep the cells in the cornea alive and useful for up to 14 days. Now the cornea, like I, we, like I said, is the window. Okay, it's the outermost layer of your eye. It's clear and transparent when it's healthy. And it's 550 microns thick, and I forgot something downstairs. But 550 microns is a really obscure thickness. You know, so to kind of picture what that is, if you have two business cards laying on top of each other, that's approximately 550 microns. Okay, so that is the approximate thickness of your cornea. It's 500. It's two business cards thick. In that two business cards of thickness, you've got five layers doing all kinds of different things in that cornea, keeping it healthy and keeping it clear. And there's more nerve endings on the surface of your cornea than any other part of your body. Which is why when you get something in your eye, your eye tears, it waters, it hurts. If you've ever had an abrasion on the surface of your cornea, it hurts a whole lot and you can't look into the light because there's so many nerve endings. This is a cross section just so you can appreciate the five layers of the cornea. And you can see the middle section here is really thick, this big old red section. Okay, that's water. All right. That's what comprises more than 80% of the total thickness of all those business cards, those two business cards. 80% of those two business cards is nothing but water. A few little collagen fibers running through it, that's that white stuff. On the very top is epithelial cells, and those are constantly, just like on our skin, we blink and the, and the, and the dead cells are sloughed away and washed away with our tears and blinking. And if we do get a small abrasion, then this heals itself, because you can see in these layers, there's many layers, just like our skin heals after a scrape or a cut, our cornea heals too. Sometimes if we get an injury deep enough, it can cause a scar, okay, because it goes below the surface of the new cells being made, and then a scar can develop in the cornea. Well, let me go back one. The very bottom layer here, you see these cells down here. That's the bottommost layer of the cornea, okay? And those are called endothelial cells. And they're the most important cell layer in the cornea. And unlike the top layer of cells, the epithelium, these cells on the bottom don't regenerate. Okay, what we're born with is the maximum number we're ever gonna have. And all that happens to these cells is that they become a little bit bigger and a little bit fewer in number over the course of our years. And their function is solely is to pump fluid through the whole front part of our eye and to keep the cornea clear. <clears throat> and so when these cells don't pump fluid as efficiently anymore, okay, because they are diseased, they have a sickness or an illness that causes them to you know, not be efficient, or there's just not enough of them to keep the cornea clear, but then the fluid builds up in this stroma, because it's like a big old sponge, it's already water. And so where else to go but right there? And as this builds up with fluid, then the cornea gets thicker. And as the cornea gets thicker, it gets cloudy, just like glass block. You know, glass block is not thin glass. It's very thick glass. And the cornea is pretty much the same way. As the stroma gets thicker and thicker with fluid, it gets more like a glass block window than a nice clear painted window. When the cornea, these corneas come back to us here at CORE, then in the eye bank, we use two different microscopes to look at them and to see you know, what's going on and, and if they're healthy or, or not. One of those instruments we use is a slit lamp. And the slit lamp is exactly the same instrument your eye doctor uses when you go to the eye doctor. He, you sit on one side, he's on the other. And it's the same instrument. And with this, we can see four of the five layers of the cornea very clearly. We can see all kinds of changes on the surface 
of the cornea, whether there's an abrasion or a cut, whether there's any types of foreign bodies or scars, even from previous surgeries. You know, um, we can see whether or not that middle layer, that stroma, is swelling, okay, and getting thicker and thicker. And just like our skin, when our skin is exposed to water a whole lot, sometimes it wrinkles, you know, temporarily. The cornea will do the same thing. It kind of wrinkles as that center stroma keeps getting thicker. So we can see all those things with that. And this is just an example of some of the things that we can see. Over here is evidence of a previous eye surgery, and you can see kind of this wheel spoke pattern here. That's actually um, from a donor who had radial keratotomy. And radial keratotomy is uh, what came before LASIK surgery. And what the surgeon did was make incisions with a scalpel into the cornea at different lengths and different depths. And by doing that, he changed the shape of the cornea so that when the light came in, it refracted it, okay? Just like a contact lens changes how the light comes into my eyes so that I can see because I wear contacts. <laughs> so I can see you all and you're all on a big blur. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what this surgery did. And he did it by hand. So I would Ooh. never let him. I would not let anybody do that to me. However, they don't do this anymore, <laughs> you know, but they don't do this anymore. Um, and, um, and sometimes, now you can see there's, how many are there? There's eight in here. Normally four or six incisions is what it took. But sometimes you needed to have a touch-up, and this person apparently did, and they have eight, okay, in their cornea. Um, so that, you know, they have 20-20 vision. So we can see that type of a thing, and that would cause the cornea not to be able to be transplanted because there's just too much intrusion, too many deep scars from that surgery. This is something called a pterygium, and it's just conjunctiva gone wild. Conjunctiva is a membrane that covers the white part of our eye and also our eyelids. So if any of you have ever had pink eye or conjunctivitis, that's the part of your eye that's inflamed. Okay, it's this thin membrane, and actually the conjunctiva in our eyes is designed to protect and take on that infection. Because if it wasn't for that membrane being there and getting hit with that inflammation, your eye would get it instead, and the inside of your eye would become infected. So this is simply conjunctiva that's decided to grow further than it's supposed to. Okay, and it grows on top of the cornea. Um, and actually, when it grows this far into the center, it does present a problem for the cornea to be transplanted. And often, with a person, this person probably would benefit from um, a certain type of transplant to get that remedied. Because it goes, it, it goes on top of the cornea, but in order to remove it all, some of the cornea has to be removed too. This is an infection that sometimes we see okay, in the cornea. And this white band at the bottom okay, is an infection. And it's a very deep one, that's why it's so opaque. And just like when I was saying about the stroma being all water, when, a, when an infection like that goes that deep into the cornea, it goes into that water. What's moving all over the place now? Okay, it's not just, even though we see it all down here, it's now all that virus or bacteria that's caused this is now moving throughout the whole cornea and contaminating it. Okay, and that, if that cornea was transplanted, would, would absolutely cause an infection in the recipient. You know, so we look at these things in the donor corneas to see whether or not you know, there's these or any other things present so that we know if the cornea is healthy for the recipient. The one layer we can't see on, a, on the microscope um, with slit layer is that bottom layer of cells, that endothelial cells I was telling you about that pump the fluid, keeping it all clear. That's because those cells are itty bitty teeny weeny. So we need a special microscope called a specular microscope. It magnifies 5,000 times, okay? And we can see the health of these cells. We can see their sizes and shapes. We can see um, whether there's any defects and even pathology. 75% of people who need a cornea transplant need it because this cell layer is sick or damaged somehow. And the rest of their cornea, like I was saying, when these cells aren't functioning properly, the rest of the cornea swells up and it's getting thicker and thicker because it can't pump this fluid that it needs to pump. And so we look at these cells to see how many there are. When we're born, we're born with approximately 4,000 cells, endothelial cells per square millimeter, okay? So if you can think of the size of a square millimeter and then pack 4,000 of anything in there, that's approximately how many we have when we're born. As we age and through, and 
heredity and through lifestyle maybe, these cells change shapes, sizes, and in numbers. And we can see that, those changes sometimes with the microscope. And this is kind of just some examples of what's good and what's not so good. This is what healthy, normal endothelium looks like. Okay, they're all uniform in size and shape, and there's lots and lots and lots of them. You can see over in, on the right-hand side in these two pictures, this one's got all different sizes and shapes. This one's just got all big, goofy sizes. But this has got little teeny ones, great big ones. That doesn't necessarily mean those corneas aren't going to be useful for transplant. Okay, because those cells are still working. They're just a goofy shape and size. Okay, um, but we want to know is how many there are in a square millimeter because that's what's really going to decide whether or not it's going to be healthy for transplant or not. But over here on the bottom left, we can see this cornea here. And it's got this big old black thing in it. Okay? And that black thing it's actually looks like a hole, but it's not. It's called a gute. And what that is, is it's a lump that grows between the membrane, the, these cells, and the membrane that these cells are attached to. And it grows up from underneath. Okay, and when it grows up from underneath, it pushes away and basically obliterates those endothelial cells. And it's not a virus, however, it's like a virus in that it spreads. And so one turns to 10, 10 to 15, and so forth until the whole endothelial layer is covered with these things. And of course, then there's not these cells pumping fluid and the cornea is just completely cloudy. And it's actually a dystrophy called Fuchs dystrophy. And uh, there are, like I said, approximately 75% of our patients uh, who need cornea transplant have that dystrophy. It affects only these cells in your cornea, no other cells anywhere in your body. So, there's several different kinds of transplants. This is one type, of, these are three types of transplants actually. One is a penetrating full thickness transplant. You can see the entire cornea, this would be the recipient down here. So all, all the five layers of the cornea from the uh, patient are removed and the donor cornea is popped in and sewn in. Then there's anterior procedures. You can see this type of procedure, there's only approximately three quarters of the cornea being replaced. That pterygium I showed you, that conjunctivagon wild picture, okay? That person more than likely would need to have one of these anterior procedures because they would need to remove some of that core of their cornea as well as that um, pterygium. And so they would replace what they removed with this anterior part of the donor cornea and pop that in and sew it in. And this is for a deep procedure. You can see what's left is only two layers. And it's that bottom layer of cells endothelial cells, because they're functioning in this, in this particular type of surgery. This patient has a really healthy bottom layer. It's the rest of it that's not good. Okay, whether it's from a deep scar, maybe that happened um, to them, or whether there's a disease process called keratoconus. And keratoconus is when your cornea actually grows into a cone shape. And it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And um, to, benefit, to fix that, they need to remove almost the entire cornea, but not quite down to this layer here, to the very bottom layer, and replace it with donor tissue. The most common transplants, though, are the, the full thickness, okay, and that's shown to you in the red there, and that's when all five layers are, are, are removed, and so for a moment, that recipient has essentially a hole when the, when the surgeon goes in and, and takes his uh, a special circular instrument and pops out that diseased portion of his patient. He does the same in that cornea that we passed around. Okay, and takes about an eight millimeter round button from that cornea and puts it right in there and replaces it and sews it into place. What's becoming more and more common is a procedure called endothelial keratoplasty. And like I had mentioned before, the endothelial cells are pumping, pumping, pumping all the time, keeping it clear. The rest of the cornea is just symptomatic. It's getting swollen, it's getting cloudy, it's not functioning and looking right only because these cells are sick. So what's been done more and more is just to replace those cells. Leave the patient's cornea intact, the whole top part, and replace only the part that's actually not working right. And that's called an, an, an acronym, DSEC, decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty. 
And what's done? Just rolls right off the top. Yeah. It does, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, with this, but unlike Pauvin and punching out a full circular disc of cornea and having essentially a hole in their patient's eye for a moment or two till that donor cornea gets back in, as in this procedure, this one, the surgeon just makes a small incision right over here on the edge. He reaches in there and with a special instrument, he can pull out those diseased cells in one full layer, okay, and sends it off to pathology where they do whatever they do there. And what he does then with the cornea that we've prepared here, core, and I'm going to show you how we do that in a minute, um, he can take those, that layer of cornea from the bottom and punch out his eight millimeters, because he still uses about eight millimeters, and he folds it in half kind of like a taco shell. It's not quite all the way folded, but sort of a taco shell fold, and slides it through this incision that he made. He opens it up inside this space here, and with an air bubble, pushes it up against his patient's cornea, okay? And that air bubble stays in place. It'll dissipate on its own, but usually about 24, 48 hours after surgery, it'll be gone. But that air bubble is what's holding this donor cornea in place, okay? And he just puts a stitch or two on the side and sends your patient home until they are seen in the office the next day. Okay, 75%, when I first started in um, 2006, we had maybe 35, 40 DSEC procedures being performed at CORE. Last year, we had over 400 performed, okay? Um, on any given week, more than 80% of our surgeries every week are for this type of cornea transplant and instead of. There are numerous benefits to the recipient for uh, having this type of transplant if it's an option for them. And again, it's an option for more than 75% of them. Um, so uh, it's really changed a lot. We have a special operating room uh, designated just for the eye bank here at CORE. It's a very small room. It's not a big fancy one like the organs and the tissue donors need. Um, but what we do is we prepare those corneas, and those corneas that you saw that were passed around, what we do is we mount it and lock it onto this, this uh, chamber here. Okay, and it's pressurized so that the cornea is actually firmed up, and you can see it's pink right here. That's that optosol. That's that fluid that the cornea was sitting in. Okay, so it, the, the, the fluid is underneath the cornea, and this, these locking rings lock the cornea in place and make it nice and firm. We take a blade like this, and we run it across the top of it, okay? We take a lot of precise measurements, and so those two business cards, 550 microns, I need to have approximately 120 microns left. All right, so I'm going to be cutting off 300 and whatever that is, um, microns, you know. So basically, I want that whole first business card and half or more of the second business card taken off, but I don't want the whole thing or I'll make a hole and ruin the cornea, okay? So we can shave that off, and that's what the surgeon takes to the OR then, what's left at the bottom of this, uh, you know, um, once that cap is cut off. And he has then about 120 microns you know, a, th a quarter or a third of the size of one business card. And that's the thickness of tissue that she's going to transplant for this patient, okay? This is post-op of the kind of the difference between the full thickness or penetrating keratoplasty, PKP. And keratoplasty is just a fancy word for cornea transplant, you know. Um, and, uh, and this is the DSEC. You can see here on the PKP patient, this suture that looks like a starburst running all the way around, it's a running suture. Okay, those, those stay in place permanently. It's one suture all the way around. It is not designed to be removed um, at any time. Here, okay, are, in, are single uh, sutures. There's one here, there's one here. There may be a couple up at the top too. Those are put in one at a time, and those are designed to be removed as needed. Because what happens, this is a surgical wound. Just like any type of surgical wound on your body, as it's healing, the whole surface of your eye is changing. You know? And so a post-op astigmatism is a real challenge for the patient and the doctor. Okay? Because it's, it, that wound is causing the light that enters the eye. It's like a camera lens. It keeps changing just a little bit you know, all the time. And so the astigmatism can be a problem by removing one of these interrupted sutures, it relaxes the cornea in that place, and, and it helps offset some of the astigmatism. It takes 
the patient anywhere from 12 to 15 months to actually have their vision stabilized to where it's going to be after this type of transplant. The difference is here, and this is an old picture, because right now with DSEC there's usually one suture and not three anymore. Okay? But the whole surface of their eye hasn't been affected. Okay? It hasn't been touched. It's, not, it's still the same lens, the same cornea that was there. And the post-op healing and visual acuity return is usually three to six months. Okay, with this type of surgery. And again, it's because they don't have that whole surgical wound all the way around their eye, as in this case here. Okay, so it's really a benefit. There's a lot of benefit for those patients to, to undergo the DSUC procedure. So, that's it. Yeah, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just, you brought up the astigmatism. Can someone with an astigmatism be a donor? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I know the shape of the eye. Right, that, yeah, that's, um, that has really nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Yes? Uh, my mother was um, a recipient mm -hmm. um, twice, actually. Both eyes. She had Fuchs disease. Okay. And, um, but she had to have another one replaced. Is, can you shed light on why that might happen? Sometimes the corneas that appear healthy as in the eye bank and, you know, look like they're going to be successful end up not working so well. Okay. Um, those cells, those endothelial cells that we count and that are so important, they're, they, they're also very fragile. Mm -hmm. And when they're exposed to air, when the cornea is manipulated, those cells do tend to fall off. You know, and, kind of, and so what happens then when they kind of just fall off, the remaining cells have to bump in and to move around and shift, and that's how you get these funky sizes and shapes of these cells. Um, some of them just, unfortunately, they, they just don't withstand. We had a, actually, a, we have to do an evaluation of the cornea before and after we cut it. We had a cornea from a 22-year-old donor, and we, did, we cut the cornea, we prepared this beautiful cornea. When I did the evaluation afterwards, the entire layer of endothelial cells just looked like a submachine gun went through it. Just because of the pressurizing, because of that whole process, those cells in his cornea just weren't strong, even though he was young. You know, they weren't strong, and that cornea was not able to be used. You know, we had to go to a different cornea. And so age actually doesn't have a lot of bearing. You know, once we evaluate the cornea, we've transplanted, I've seen corneas from donors who are 70 that are stunning, you know, compared to somebody who is 25 or 30. Um, and so it really, you know, age really has not a lot of um, effect, you know, on, on really the outcome of the cornea. So is she doing a better now with the second oh, yeah. go around? She yeah. had to wear a contact, actually, for after one of them, and then the second one she didn't have to. Did she have a DSEC procedure done? Do you know? I know the first one she had all those stitches. Okay, so. And then the second one I'm not sure. Yeah, because Fuchs is one of those transplant, those diagnoses that the DSEC so is. The bottom layer. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. As is indicating, that's the only layer that's not working. She's got all that gutata stuff right. right in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's in there? A gel or something so that it doesn't collapse? In your eye? Yeah. There's two fluids, actually, that are in your eye. Let me just kind of, let me go back to my little picture here really quick. There we go. Here. In, back in here, okay, this is the main body part of the eye. There's a, there is um, a substance called vitreous. If any of you watch crime TV, you know, having vitreous and drawing vitreous from the, you know, from, from the patient in the morgue is all about, you know, the, what the coroners and medical examiners want. Um, that's a jelly-like substance. There's also other fluid right in here, and it's in this space right here between the cornea and our iris, okay, the colored part of our eye, and that's called aqueous, okay, aqueous humor, and that's, that's actually produced um, on either side here in, a, in an area of the eye called the ciliary body. That's kind of where glaucoma can, can start, okay, is where, where that part of the ciliary on the edges starts to malfunction. But that aqueous is what the endothelial cells are pumping through, because it's nourishing. It's moving this aqueous through the cornea, but also through the whole anterior part of the eye, so that your iris is healthy, you know, the ciliary is clear, and all everything's working right, you know, 
So that's, and, and, and that's not a jelly substance, but it's a, it's a fluid, that, and that's what your doctor measures actually when you have your pressure tested at the eye doctor. Do that what, pop of air. Why doesn't it leak when you have a hole in your eye? It, oh, it can. <laughs> oh, it can, yeah, it can. And, you know, then you usually need to, they'll, they'll glue you sometimes. Depends on where the leak is, you know, if you have a perforation. Um, actually, uh, we've had, um, you know, emergency transplant, emergency cornea transplants, and oftentimes it's from a perforation of the cornea where, and they are losing this fluid. Well, how do they keep you from losing it when they're doing that? They can replace it. Oh. Yeah, there's a solution. Yeah, there's a solution. Um, that vitreous they try not to tamper with because that's harder to replace. That's in the back. Um, but the, the actually the aqueous can um, um, be replaced with um, a solution called balanced salt solution. And, um, so, so it's kind of like a saline type thing. Kind of, kind of, but it's sterile. It's, oh, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a sterile. It's um, you know it's really one of the only products on the market that is used for that. That is safe to be used inside mm -hmm. your eye. Because you know, a lot of other solutions can damage the eye, you know, and, and the parts, and because your heart, heart, eye is very complicated. <laughs> so it really is. It's like a camera. It's doing all kinds of stuff all at once. <laughs> Anyhow, anybody else have any questions? Pretty yes. amazing, huh? Yes. I, 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 I got to say something, okay? When you try to put these programs together, and it's very tight, and all of a sudden, Susan becomes three. You say, uh oh, here we go. We're out of control already. <laughs> and she comes up with this fascinating presentation. I'm watching time. Okay. And then all of a sudden you get the insight. You're not running this show. The <laughs> guy's running the show. I'll tell you a quick story and I'll pick, come back to this. At the 2011 conference, one of our speakers, Harvey myself, brought a guest. He said she's on the board of our OPO. Would you mind? I said, no, she'll bring her along. And so at a break I was introduced to her. And uh, I said, you know, would you like to say hello to the group, you know, from the, the table? No, no, I don't think so. I said, all right, well, think about it after the break if you change your mind. Not a problem. I got a very tight agenda. I wanted to, to just introduce herself, you know, two sentences. So I come back to the break. She says, I think I will. I said, okay, come on up front and, you know, say hello. Forty-five minutes later, <laughs> we had the best presentation of the entire workshop. I mean, she was amazing. She came in and shared her experience of several weeks in Iran studying their organ program, which is the only country in the world that pays for organ donation and has no waiting list. They have a waiting list of donors. It was fascinating. I'm sitting there fascinated, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, 45 minutes, what are we going to do to this program? Oh, I'm looking, I'm looking. For as many times as I've gone over the agenda, I made a mistake. There was 45 minutes of blank space in here that I didn't realize was there, and she filled it up perfectly. And I said, thank you. <laughs> so she's up here giving this fascinating presentation. I've never seen this before. We've been trying now for two years to get our iBank to give us a presentation on exactly what you just shared so that we can capture it for the transplant presentation library that we sent out to your chapters. Still don't have it. Guess what? We now have it. And midway in that concern, I realized, oh, you're in charge again. Thank you very much. I thought it was too long. You were not too long. You, you were answered in prayer. Okay. And do I have your permission to use this in our absolutely. library? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Your witnesses were okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>